Hey everyone, welcome back to um, another day for our daily devotions. Uh, we come now to the very end of the book of Hebrews. We started last week in chapter 8, and now we find ourselves at the very end of the book, chapter 13. I would just want to remind you that, again that if you want to find our reading plan, you can go to our social media uh, page, Facebook, Twitter, and others, and uh, you can click the, uh, the reading link, or on this page, if you're on YouTube, it's below. If you're on Facebook, it's a little, a little higher, and you can find that link there. Uh, so let's finish out the, the book of Hebrews. We're in Hebrews chapter 13, and uh, one of the things, it, it, weird things, I guess, about me, if you want to say, is I find fascinating how things end. If you're reading a book, I think how you begin and end a book is very important. Uh, but I'm always curious about that last sentence, that last paragraph, those final lines. I, I find uh, hearing what people's final words were, right? Because it, it boils down to what matters the most, period, right? If, 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 if you had to summarize what you want people to remember about you, your last words, what would they be? If you were writing a book of the Bible and, and, and you're going to leave people with, with one thing, what would it be? And so I find the ending of, of the books of the Bible a really fascinating subject and really something worth, worth uh, studying maybe on your own. So we find ourselves in the final chapter. Remember what we've said in our study of Hebrews is the first 11 chapters, give or take, are deeply theological. They, the, the writer of Hebrews walks you through and shows you why Jesus is supreme. And the reason that theological issue is so important is because of the real-life practicality of it. The, writer, the, the first readers are suffering under severe persecution. They are suffering for the cause of Christ. And they're tempted to flee from the faith or redefine the faith in a way that is safer for them. But the writer says that anything but the true, real, powerful Jesus is a lesser Jesus, is a lesser option. Jesus is supreme, and Jesus is superior, and he lays that out, and we've, we've spent several days looking at it. Chapter 13, like chapter 12, is very practical, but chapter 13 is, is a summary of what it means uh, to be a Christian. What does a Christian really look like? The first thing he tells us in verses 1 through 6 is that a Christian is defined by love. It is defined by love. In fact, notice how chapter 13 begins. Here in verse 1, he says, there's, the, here's your thesis, let brotherly love continue. As you can imagine, uh, the Greek word is where we get our word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Phileo aldephoi, brotherly love. And that's what he's saying here. It isn't necessarily agape love, which lies at the root of all Christian love. But here, it's, it's charitable love. It's, it's a friendly love. It's a brotherly love. Now, how that plays out practically, you'll notice verse 2, that means showing hospitality. Do not neglect to show hospitality to the strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. So, so it is hospitality. Be open uh, and generous with your time and your attention and your home. Now obviously with coronavirus we're limited with opening our homes and, and even shaking hands if, if, if you want. Um, but, but the idea is we can have a spirit of hospitality. We can have a spirit that, that when we speak to people we, we, we listen to them, listen to them intently, and that their story matters. And we know their stories matters because the gospel story is what matters, and it speaks into all of our lives. In verse 3, he says, Brotherly love shows up with compassion, and he mentions one area in particular. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you are in the body. Now, the application is to be compassionate and gracious to, toward those that, that are in prison. Now, as a general rule, I think that is a vital ministry that Christians aren't engaged enough with. I've done some prison ministry. I've spoken to, to many and ministered to many who, who are in and out of prison and, and going through that process. I've been to a lot of trials and, and, and whatnot. Uh, that is important ministry. But what you need to notice is, although that is generally true, he has a specific prisoner in mind, and that is prisoners who are there because of their faith. Remember the context is they're suffering because of the cause of Christ. And he says how you should respond is by showing brotherly love even to those who are in prison. Don't isolate yourself from them. 
They need your grace and your mercy. Now, that is true, too. We should be compassionate towards all prisoners. We should be compassionate towards, towards fellow believers who are suffering. Um, but as a general rule, we should be people who show love when people are, are in need. And what an opportunity we have right now. If you're watching this, chances are you're watching it in the context of the coronavirus. You're home, or, or maybe you're at work, but work isn't what it used to be. Uh, maybe it's slowed down. Maybe it has sped up. Uh, but regardless, all of our lives have changed. And the question we should be asking ourselves is not, um, uh, not what am I going to do? Or, or I can't believe this is happening. Our response should be is, how can I show brotherly love to others? Your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers, other believers, uh, strangers. How can we show love, hospitality, compassion towards others. Well, um, then he, he goes from talking about brotherly love in verses 1 to 3 to relational love in verse 4. But he says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Now notice, he switches. He's still talking about love, right? A Christian is defined by their love. He switches here to emphasize not just general brotherly love. But now he wants to talk about relational love. And so he warns on the negative side, uh, the, 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 he warns against adultery and other forms of, of immorality. He says, avoid those things. Those things aren't truly loving. We may say, but this person loves me, or but I love them, or my motivation is love. He says, no, 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 no. You don't understand that, that the connection between relational love and brotherly love is, is shown right here. If I violate my marriage vows, I'm not just violating a relational love. I'm failing to show brotherly love to my spouse, to my children, to their family, to my family, and to others. Remember that every sin has a victim. And so he sees a connection between brotherly love and relational love. But also notice he wants your marriage to be a good marriage. And the key is love. Not love ill-defined, as we'll see, but, but it's love defined by the gospel. Don't pollute this gift of love that God has given you. And if you're married, you have been given a truly a wonderful gift. And you should see your spouse not as someone that you have earned, but a gift from God that you have been given. And so in your relationships, show brotherly love. Now, what he does in these first six verses is he, he, he tells us Christians should be defined by love. But then he shows us there's a positive side of love. Brotherly and relational love are two examples. But then there is a negative side of love. Notice the language he has starting in verse 5. He says, Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Like all things in this world, there is a good and there is a bad of it, right? We live in a corrupt, crooked world. And so we often will take the good and we'll corrupt them for the bad. Sometimes we can take the bad and use them for good. One of my hopes during this time of coronavirus is that we would spread the gospel in the way that the coronavirus is spreading uh, among the nations, right? And so we would use the tools that we have to spread the good news of the gospel. So we'll take something bad, we want to use it for good. Uh, let me give you another example that is prescient. Um, do you know how the flu vaccine works? Flu vaccine works when you take the bad, that is the flu, influenza, all that sort of stuff, and you actually inject it into the body. Now, you're not just saying, here, here's a flu, you'll get used to it, right? But rather, it's designed in such a way that the body is able to fight off so as to prevent from getting the flu. So you have to expose yourself through the vaccine in order to fight it off. Now, I'm no medical doctor or any of that, but, but, but if, if my reckoning is correct, I think it's mostly correct. Again, I'm not a medical doctor, or, or nor have I stayed in a Holiday Inn recently. But the idea is that you can take that bad thing and use it for good. Well, that is true. But often what happens is we take a good thing and we use it for evil. And so the writer of Hebrews says, yes, you should be characterized by love. 
but we define that by the positive side of love, brotherly, relationship, relational love, not the negative side of love. And what he has in mind here is very clear, and that is idolatry, greed, lust, envy. You see, at the root of those things is love. So here he describes the love of money as one example. We can look at a dozen others. His answer is, don't live by this negative love, a lust for more. Live by positive love, that is contentment. See, when you live by covetousness, greed, envy, that sin will have its victims. Brotherly love produces contentment, and that frees us to serve and love others. Remember that sin always takes Love always gives. So a Christian is to be defined by our love. In fact, isn't that the old hymn we, we, we sing? Uh, they will know that we are Christians by our love. The second thing he says is that Christians are not only defined by love, they're defined by humility. Verses 7 to 17. Um, now, time won't allow us to go in, into a lot of detail here because he, he gets a bit theological again. But notice in verse 7, he says that discipleship requires humility, right? His big idea is humility, but then he applies it in specific areas. The first area is discipleship. Notice how, how he picks up on this. Remember your leaders who spoke to you the word of God, considering, consider the outcome of their way of life, and imitate their faith. Now, this is a general thesis here that he has. That is, remember your spiritual leaders. Now, spiritual leaders are called by God to disciple believers and to lead them to greater righteousness. They do this primarily, not exclusively, but primarily in two ways. First, by teaching right doctrine, and secondly, by modeling righteousness. There's a reason why scandals among uh, spiritual leaders is a serious threat to the health of the local church. And, and, and we should be deeply concerned that these scandals, big and small scandals alike, that is, large scandals of people we would recognize and the more local scandals, where only local people would know who this person is, has a real effect on how people perceive the power of the gospel. And so a spiritual leader is to train and he is to, to model the good news of the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. This means that submission to that teaching Submission to that way of life requires humility. And so, and the reason is that when we first come to the faith, truth is, we don't know what, what we're doing. Let's be honest. This is all new to us. But the truth is, maybe you've been a Christian for five decades, and guess what? You still ain't got it all figured out. And I would add that maybe you're a minister of the gospel watching this, and I would say you may have the, the, uh, more degrees than, than, a, than a, a, a thermometer, but you still don't have it all figured out. One of the humbling aspects of ministry is the reality that I'm still struggling in a lot of these areas. So as the Lord teaches me, may I model and, and teach others. But, but you see the, the humility there is, is we err when we think that we can just go figure out on our own, or I can just Google it, right? It's, what I get from my pastor is going to be the same thing I can get from Google. And, and that is far from the truth. We need each other in the local church to encourage, to build one another up, to hold one another accountable, and to grow together as disciples. In fact, he warns against this, right? Where, where he says that um, faithfulness, not only does discipleship require humility, faithfulness requires humility. He goes through there and, and he, he says in verses 9 through 14, don't be led astray by false doctrine. And he gives an example of, of a practical way that false doctrine has inserted itself into the local church. He says, the problem is, is the lack of humility. If you think, well, this is my life, I can do what I want, you're going to open the door with such arrogance to false teaching. And false teaching leads to sin. Sin leads to victims. He says, but, but faithfulness requires humility. Stick to the plan. Keep following Jesus. In order to do that, we must not only be characterized by our love, but by our humility. Finally, verse 15 to 16, he says that service requires humility. Notice verse 15, uh, how, how he lays this out. 
he says, Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Our service begins with worship. When we see God for who he really is, we'll serve and love our neighbor the way they, they need us to. Love God first, then love your neighbor. So he begins with worship, and then he adds love, verse 16. So after he tells us the worship, verse 16, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Notice, we worship a God who is sacrificed, and in so doing, we sacrifice ourselves for others. One always leads to the other. But at its root is humility. Let us love God, a humble act, so we can love others, a humbling act. The last thing he, he tells us, how, how are Christians to be defined? The last thing he tells us is prayer. Christians are defined by prayer. Notice verse 18 and 19. Pray for us, he says. You don't need a seminary degree to know what he's saying there. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. As he says, look, if there's one thing you could do for me, yes, love one another. Yes, walk in humility and faith. But pray. A person who loves is a person who prays. A person who is humble is a person who prays. So, I suspect most of us have a little more time on our hands in one way or another. Are you using that time to enhance your prayer life? Or is it being snuffed out by what you're searching for to fill the time? A robust prayer life and the person who has a robust prayer life is a person who loves and walks in humility. And notice specifically what he asks his church to pray for him. Praise that he would be pure, that is, he has a clear conscience. Pray that he would be faithful, that is, to act honorably, the text says. And he prays that he would be present, that is, he misses his people. Sometimes when you read the Bible and you recognize it's in a unique and special context, but when you read it from where you are, forgive me, that's, that's my phone, you realize that the Bible speaks to us where we are even now. Are you praying that you would be pure, you would be faithful, and you long for the day you would be together with other believers in Christ? How's your prayer life? How's your humility? How's your love? Can I read to you the very last verse of the book of Hebrews? Again, I think how a book like this ends says a lot. It ends, its benediction is actually a greeting. Usually we find this at the beginning, say, of Paul or Peter's letters. But this writer puts it at the end. It's verse 25. Grace be with you all. It's simple, isn't it? But very profound. What is the glue to the whole book of Hebrews? And I would add the glue to what it means to be a believer. Grace. It's the gospel. So I'd like to conclude the way this writer concludes. May grace go with you. May grace be with us all. Tomorrow we'll be looking at the book of Galatians. I'm looking forward to it.